it is such a pleasure to do this. I know um, we were together at the ICI conference uh, this year online, and it was quite an event. We were both just talking before this about, um, wow, it was like 12-hour days and so intense and so much fun, but it was an amazing amount of information. And I always get excited uh, talking to people like you because we have a common passion for helping patients who have environmentally related illness. So welcome, welcome. Um, I'm just going to do a little housekeeping and then I'll introduce you. Um, very basic here. If you want to uh, find uh, more YouTube videos, you can go to my YouTube channel, just Jill Carnahan on the YouTube. Um, and uh, Michael has his own program. It's IEP Radio. And where can they find you for more information on what you've recorded? Absolutely. IEPRadio.com. If you go there, there's a wealth of information. Awesome. Very cool. And so we just decided to do kind of a co-recording here. We'll probably both end up having this on our shows. Um, so you'll get that information in multiple uh, locations. And I want to just introduce Michael Schrantz. Um, he's the founder and operator of Environmental Analytics, LLC, um, comprehensive indoor air quality consulting company that offers a wide range of services. So the thing I want to say about Michael is there's his website, environmentalanalytics.net. You can find so much great information, a blog, and then, of course, links to his podcast on all outlets. Um, but what I want to say is just personal about him. You know, here I am a doc in mold-related illness, and what I love to do is help patients like my own journey in getting out of a moldy environment and then getting well after that. And I always say, you know, I can diagnose you and treat you in the clinic, but nothing I do um, is really going to stick or going to make a massive difference in your life if you're still living in a really moldy environment. And that's just the truth. And so I need people like Michael. I value him so much because of his expertise. And what we're so grateful for in ICI is that we have someone like him on board, creating protocols, um, writing up the latest data, and really helping us guide us doctors. So today, what we really wanted to dive in to was how do we work together better? How do we, so whether you're a patient listening online, um, and you want to have your doctor, you know, work with an IEP or understand more about what they do, or whether you're like me practicing and you're listening, if you're a colleague and you're struggling because in your area, you don't have a great IEP, we will dive into that and what to do. And I know one of the great things about Michael is he does virtual consults. Um, I would love to, before we dive into exactly what you do and some of the questions, I want to know your story. Like what got you into this, Michael, and how did you get to where you're at now? Dr. Jill, thank you for having me first off. And uh, I was looking forward to this, uh, this interview because uh, it's going to be so rich for people that are in that struggle that you've identified. Um, I'll try to give you the two-minute elevator speech. Uh, for me, it started uh, actually nothing to do with chronic illness. I was 16 years old working for a local air conditioning company. Uh, I, was, I was at the bottom pole of, of you know, learning about the basics of airflow. And, and, and of course, did I know that it would turn into what it is today? No. As I went through high school and college, um, I still didn't think I was going to become an indoor environment professional. I thought I was going to be a cog working for some corporate uh, mm -hmm. company, um, but just found a passion because while I was doing that, I was engaged in um, the, divi the division of the air conditioning company had indoor air quality, and we were out looking at things and trying to solve problems that people weren't able to solve. And, and it was a very rewarding thing where we would go out there and diagnose the home and figure it out. And then you know, fast forward through uh, getting certified and, and, and learning more and more about indoor air quality, what had happened is, is one day uh, a lady by the name of Dr. Mary Ackerley came knocking on my door with a mutual client and, and said, hey, I, I, I saw what you did on this particular home and I like it. Let me explain a little bit about the people that you're dealing with. Um, yeah. And fast forward five, seven years later, um, and it's been the most rewarding thing being able to not only understand people who have chronic illness, uh, but understand what the concept of low dose environmental exposure means. Uh, because unfortunately, the, the traditional paradigm with a lot of the inspectors out there that even mean well, um, are missing a lot of the low hanging fruits because they don't know that those fruits are there. Oh, I love that. So your initial interaction was kind of like what we're talking about now is how do we actually get together? And I'm sure Mary, um, who I love and appreciate so much, it was very similar to me as we, we realize our hands are tied if we don't have good people in the, in the field. And we can learn and understand and do little tiny bits of like guiding them, but we are not the experts. Um, we, again, by default, we have to learn a lot about it. And I become just a, enough of an expert to guide them to people like you. But tell us, I want to know more. Um, tell us like what kind of training that you've had or how you get to be what you've done and what does IEP for people who've never heard that term let's go to the real basics 
Yeah. Okay, sure. Well, so it, IEP stands for Indoor Environmental Professional. It, it, it's kind of a generic term. It's meant to be all broad and all encompassing of people who do environmental work. But I mean, it can cover a wide range. It's not just about mold. Yeah. You can have people who deal with chemical exposures and that uh, sort of thing. Uh, predominantly, a lot of the certifications that I acquired uh, came through an organization called the American Council of Accredited Certification, or ACAC.org. Yeah. And um, I carry a couple certifications through them. One of them is a council certified indoor environmental consultant. Another one is a council certified microbial investigator. Uh, and I carry a couple other uh, certifications, one of which is a building performance institute, which really is just trying to capture knowledge about how a building breeze, how it operates. And so I wasn't, I didn't go to a school of public health. Uh, I did, there's not a formal degree program that I'm aware of that you can go to a college university level. It had to build up, build upon yeah. multiple certifications to become where I'm at today. Yeah, no, you are one of the best in the field. And that's why I wanted to really bring people's attention to this is not something that is uh, number one, the, the the level of information that you have, especially with how you work with physicians and patients. Um, what I see is I see a lot of people who've been in the field and maybe know how to find mold in the wall and they have no clue of how it affects the human body. Um, and maybe I can speak to that really quickly because we have these people called canaries and Mary and I ha tend to have 90% of our offices, <laughs> patients that are super sensitive and they have mast cell activation. So they're extra reactive. And so what we deal is with this subset that is, say you have a house that has mold and you remediate and you find out the problem and the issue. There might be 80% of people, 90% of people that can go back in there, no problem at all. But what we end up having it between you and I is the subset of really, really super sensitive patients. And it's not always mold that's the issue. Tell us just a little bit about what else can be in the environment that can make this, whether it's dust or VOCs from other sources, or go through just a little bit of the spectrum, because we always think about mold, but there's a lot more to it than that, right? There is. And I mean, uh, to segue into that question real quick, I think that's the trigger is a lot of this that we're, list we're working on is pioneering work. Um, mm -hmm. While there might not be a degree, what we're learning are, are from references and, and peer-reviewed studies and, and consensus among peers of what we're seeing, what we know about sampling, what we know about it, exposure. Uh, good news is we are actually working in bed with a local university here trying to create a program that will one day um, provide a, certi a certification or degree for IEPs because it is broad to your question. Um, a lot of the people that we work with um, have some sort of immune response uh, or inflammatory response to a whole host of things uh, called a soup. And, and everyone knows when we think of water damaged buildings, we hear about mold. Mold is the celebrity surrogate that can represent a lot of different things, including bacteria that we sample for, but you also have other things, right? We have things like uh, chemicals, volatile organic compounds. Um, we have just general, um, the general makeup of the home, um, it's depending on what reference you look at, you know, what you believe in from the standpoint of like, say for example, CIRS, um, we know that high particulate counts in a home it's not even limited to, say, mold or bacteria. It could just be the fact that your house was very dusty. Somebody could have an inflammatory response yes. to that. And then now with the segue of EMF, we're looking at um, uh, that, those sorts of exposures. There is a soup of things that both the IEP is presented with and also the clinician is, is, is presented with. And we try to work together as professionals to say, is there any way we can narrow this down? Because most people can't have you show up in your vehicle and do $50,000 worth of sampling. Right. That's the struggle. Yeah. So I want to tell you like a clinical scenario that I might have. And then I want to hear like how you would, and even if you advise me, Hey Jill, next time you could do this or that, I really am open. I want to hear because That's why we're here is like, say here, I'm in the office of the patient. So a typical patient that would come in, um, you know, maybe a 45 year old female who um, has started to have more fatigue, more headaches, migraines, um, brain fog is this elusive term that is not medical at all, but it usually means uh, trouble with word finding or a little bit more cognitive cognitive issues with memory. Um, sometimes they'll notice um, like a lack of focus or concentration or like for me, when I was in mold, what I noticed is I could write a blog article in an hour normally. And then all of a sudden with the mold, it took me longer to slog through. It was a more difficult, like the concentration it took to sit and read or to write or to do the 
things that I used to do during the mold exposure, it just took me longer and more effort. Like it, my brain was tired. So that brain fog is kind of this big term and that's super common. I would say the mental clarity, the brain stuff is probably one of the number one things we see in a moldy environment, but then it can have things like rashes, histamine, um, more allergic responses to food. You could have, I've had heartburn be a MCAS reaction where people go into a moldy home and have heartburn. So again, this 45 year woman has a myriad of complaints and I look down her list and I'm like, uh, this is concerning. I need to go down this pathway. And I might look for metabolic issues, thyroid issues, adrenal issues, everything. And in my um, uh, battery of tests, one of the things I typically do is I will do some markers in the blood that show inflammation. And then I will also do urinary mycotoxin testing. And none of these are one size fits all. So the markers in the blood, things like TGF beta, MSH, MMP9, VEGF, and then C4A, C3A. And if I see a pattern that's concerning for immune inflammation activation based on an external trigger. And then I see urinary mycotoxins that are high. I say, we need to make sure, we don't know for sure yet, but we need to make sure that mold is not in your environment. So what I would typically do is say, depending on what you can afford, you might try just to get your brain around this. Sometimes what I do, Mike, is a little secret thing. And what it is, is whether it's testing them for food allergies or testing them mold in their environment, even though I know like an ERMI dust sample, we'll talk about in a minute, and you can speak to that and the validity or plates, they're not the best. They're just a tiny little sample of one little piece of the environment. It does not tell you yes or no, there's mold, but it's one thing they have control and it's fairly inexpensive. And what I see that happens when I do that is they give me the report and I'm like, oh my gosh, you have 30 ketomium. I don't like that. <laughs> That's real, or even five. <laughs> Sometimes You're cheating. That's a little hanging fruit, but I like right, it. Right, right. Okay, so, so let's say there's 200 aspergillus. I'm still like, oh, right, right. I, right, okay. So, but then when I do, it's like, okay, look at this. You need to go deeper and then they'll call you or then they'll, and so sometimes it's like the way to get them to buy in. And I'm well, I would love to hear your opinion on this because if you, okay. if you have other advice for me, but I feel like what happens is on black and white paper, then I can make an argument for them going going deeper and getting the right inspection. Because you and I both know if they just do, so in a second, I'll have you explain the dust plates and the ERMI sample. But oh, if they sure. just do these, these are not end all be alls. And you and I both agree, I don't even use the ERMI score. I don't mm -hmm. like it, it's Beautiful. not valid. But I do look at the individual species and if I see a pattern of one thing that's way off the charts, I'm like, where did that come from? It just makes me question. But then I can usually get them to call someone like you and then you come in and then you can help the process. But what would your um, comments on that process be? What would you change, do differently? What would you advise for us? You set the stage up very good for me, like you tossed me a lob, which so now I can swing away. I love this, I'm salivating. <laughs> See, so what you did right, selfishly for me, from my perspective, is that you did the part of the clinician up front and you helped us. You were looking at cytokine activity or urine analysis, and you were trying to use biomarkers to help justify, again, nothing's black and white, but to support the idea of, is my patient being exposed to some sort of an exposure? And for the sake of this conversation, because both of us know this could go on for weeks if we yeah. did everything, say it was mold exposure we were yeah. concerned about. Um, the first thing I would do as the IEP is listen to what those the, about the patient. So you've given us some information. Here's my background. Um, Dr. Jill came back and she says that I have upregulation of these genes. She thinks that I'm currently being exposed. I'd like to take a look at that home. Okay, thank you. That helps me. In other words, we're not necessarily looking for EMF. I'm not saying that you're blind to it, but our focus yeah. is definitely going to include mold. Um, we would normally start with um, after sitting down with the client and learning that information is doing a very good visual assessment. And, and it's the things that I've heard you talk with a host of other wonderful people on your show. Um, you know, you're looking at the low hanging fruits. You have a basement, a crawl space, you know, the attics, the plumbing leaks, the landscaping, the swamp cooler, the HVAC system. And you're trying to see if there's any low hanging fruit. Uh, issues that we can point at and say, you don't need to sample this necessarily yeah. for me to tell you, you need to remediate it. But in a vast majority of times, people yeah. don't call me up because they have 20 square feet of mold growing up a wall and they just want me to confirm it. I don't get those right. easy ones. Right. <laughs> the ones I get uh, are the ones where they're like, we either don't see anything or it's always this ominous, well, we had a leak, but it wasn't a big deal or the classic, I think it's a problem, but my angry spouse doesn't think it's an issue. I mean, and 
Little did we know we'd be relationship therapists too, right? Oh my gosh. (laughs) As Mary told me, you have to have an associates and a degree in that just to have this because it's very real. And, and a big part of what I think is missing in the professional practice is the heart, the, the love, the, 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 the ability to connect with boundaries, healthy boundaries so that you can understand truly what this person is dealing with or else you ain't going to know how to communicate with them. But at the end of the day, you, you, you might end up looking at sampling and I won't go eight levels deep with you, but a couple basics. Yeah. IEPs have tools they can use and beyond any visual thing like um, a a pair of eyeballs and a flashlight or an infrared camera or the moisture meter that you're all familiar with, we do hear that there's different types of samples. I think the takeaway is what can the sample help answer? So if you're doing qPCR analysis and a lot of people know that as Ermes or Hertzmes, are you working with an individual who can look at it. I want to share. Um, if you get a chance, let me share my screen. I want to share sure. something with you. Yeah, yeah, um, me... But can they look at data and maybe take control samples outside, knowing what they would expect to find inside this home? We call that normal fungal ecology. Mm-hmm. The term mold free is misunderstood by too many people. I think what people are trying to say is they don't want to have mold growing in their house, but they're going to have normal backgrounds from the yeah. outside. So the ability, I'll share this with you real quick. Yeah. Um, for example, like this is a, just a quick sheet of, of what I've taken of hundreds of qPCR samples wow. where the little gray columns you see flashing by are outdoor control samples. And I have a whole bunch of, of individual species and I've been able to look at that and you see what's normal. Um, it's no different than people talking about uh, spore trap sampling um, and, and comparing indoor to outdoor. Here's my point yeah. is you want to work with a professional who can look at the house and use tools that might be able to identify something that might not be able to be identified with other methods. I love Petri dish samples. I think it boils down to what can you help answer if somebody does a DIY Uh because they initially just want to see what's up. I don't have a problem with that. If you're working with a disgruntled husband or you just want to wake the people up to, you know, Hey, you, you might have a problem here. That's great. But when you bring in a professional, A professional is going to want to reference indoor with outdoors. We need to know what's normal. So it's using the tools to ultimately help isolate a problem. What if the master bedroom comes back elevated? One one example of a thousand. And you you upon further reflection and and investigation, you find out that the master bedroom had a crawl space attic attic door or access door. Mm -hmm. And there was a known problem that was identified in the crawl space is the reason why the master bedroom is elevated is because of that potential area or something else. So it's working through the minutia of the history and knowing what's there to figure out, can an area sample like QPCR, spore trap, Petri dish, swabs, tapes help answer the question? Or do we need to get into wall cavity sampling? Yeah. Do, we need to use, or do we need to start punching into walls a little bit to see if we can locate the actual source? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, oh, there's so many questions that come to mind because I, right. like, I got you here and this is so great. And um, so a couple of things I want to go through, like what I would talk to patients, like questions. I want you to add if there's any, because people listening, the first thing I find, I found this five years ago, if I just say, do you have mold in your house? Almost 100% of the time, I'm going to get a no <laughs> or no, we, or even better. We've already had three inspections and they've all come back fine or five or more. Like this is so common. The uh, I call it denial because I went through that too. And there's a piece of denial, and then there's a piece of just the reality that no inspector's perfect. And um, often, if they're yeah, and I'm same with physicians, right? We're trying to find answers with with lots and lots of data, and it's not always easy to come to a really concrete conclusion. But what I I look for is patterns. I know you do too. We're pattern recognition detectives. So what we're looking for is what do all the clues lead to? So when I'm looking at a patient, I get this all the time. Where's what's the one mold test? There's no one mold test. There's no one environmental test. There's uh, So whether I'm the physician or you're the environmental air quality professional, um, there's no one test and there's no one way. But I want to go back to questions. So what I'm typically doing instead is I'm doing the workaround. So do you have a swamp cooler? Do you have any crawl spaces? Have they been sealed? Do you ever smell a musty smell? Have you ever had leakage from your sump pump in your basement? Do you have a basement? Do you have a sump pump? Is there concrete? Is there carpet? Is there tile? Is the tile loose? Um, have you ever had leakage of your toilet or bathrooms or under 
under your sinks? What about your garbage disposal? How about your washer and dryer? Do you have a front load washer or dryer? Does it smell bad when you take the clothes out, when you open that up? If you looked in the gasket, is there black gunk in the gasket? Um, what about your windows? Are they sealed? Do you ever have condensation on the windows? Is there leakage around the windows? What about your attic? Is that connected the airspace to your home? Is there dead animals in your attic? Is there urine issues with dogs or cats in your house or attic? And so these are just some of the things that I think about. And because when they start to then you get them thinking and they'll be like, oh yeah, we had uh, my washing machine flooded and it actually went through the floor and down below. And we just, we put some fans out and we dried it out. What would you yeah. say to that? <laughs> Uh, my, my instant response in my head was yellow flag and, and it might be upgraded to a red flag. I think that's the issue is, and it gets even worse. First of all, those little nuggets that you gave, uh, gave are brilliant, not just for clinicians that are listening, but for uh, the patients and people that are wanting to learn more. Maybe they're struggling with their own justification to, you know, take the next step, which we can get into in a little bit, or they have that, that disgruntled spouse issue, which unfortunately is more common than I'd like to admit to everybody. <clears throat> I think at the end of the day, it's, it's an assumption that's being made. Yeah, but we put a fan on there. We have a little Honeywell fan that we bought for $10 and we blew out this wall. It's like, well, the, the, I, I hate the expression, but the devil's in the details. I, I think that the act was great and valiant. And I'm so glad and so happy that you were proactive and nobody wants to make this. Um, we talk about fears. We don't yeah. want to make a mountain out of a molehill, but we can't just la 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 and act like there's nothing in that wall because you put a 10 inch circular fan on it blowing on it there's so many different areas that could have stayed wet long enough for microbial growth and that's ultimately one of your concerns as a clinician and an occupant is exposure from that area yeah so talk just a little bit about again this is new to me but i really start to understand whether it's the um lights on your you know ceiling the can lights or whether it's the outlets or whether it's your attic space that connects or your crawl space why is it important for people to understand the envelope of their home and keeping that air quality, you know, basically as pure as you can and without the interference? Um, I'll just give you an example. I had uh, in my current office, before I ever moved in, the office below me had a slight mold issue and it got remediated. My office was perfect, but I realized that actually um, sealing the outlets, all the wall space that connected between my office and any other part of the building, I have this like bubble of my office. And part of that is very deliberate because there's no air um, contamination from the other parts of the building. Why is that important from attic and crawl space, et cetera? Absolutely. I was trying to pull up another photo I wanted to share yeah. with everybody um, uh, just because it will help. Um, I, I stole this obviously here on Google from oh, EPA's wow. website, right about leakage. So what we have is <clears throat> we're dealing with an issue of a conditioned space versus unconditioned spaces. And I'm sure that if you were an artist, uh, you can explain this differently, but here's how I explain it. Um, you have the most control in the areas that you live and occupy in, but there are a bunch of spaces in the home that you don't really condition or control. You don't vacuum it. You don't control the temperature, the humidity, that sort of thing. Uh, and a lot of the attic spaces are a big one. Uh, crawl spaces are a big one. Interstitial wall cavities are yeah. a big one. And these are areas where, listen, we're not, our goal isn't to create a glass house for you. I right. mean, there are so many complicated issues that I don't know that we have time to get into about, you know, the fact that most every house that's got wood framing is going to have some percentage of lumberyard mold on it. And we consider this maybe normal. Here's my takeaway. If you can separate and isolate out the non-conditioned spaces as much as possible, you have more control. So uh, to what Jill was saying earlier, you know, you have can lights and these arrows, they're not meant to be just be one way. They can be two ways. Yeah. Summertime in Arizona, uh, baking up that attic, getting that temperature nice and hot, you're going to have a driving force, uh, all things, other things being equal into the home through these penetrations. And that exists even from crawl space to home. So mm -hmm beyond identifying a source that is justified by a professional that needs to be remediated, you still try and minimize the communication from these areas. And I'm not talking energy efficiency. That's a whole other right. thing. I just mean from an environmental standpoint, if you can protect and seal off your environment as best as possible, there's some things we need to think about when we do that, like ventilation and how that affects, sealing up the house affects ventilation. But you'll minimize the communication from these interstitial uh, spaces, which can also serve as pathways for the contaminants to get into. I, have a, I had an issue in my wall. There was growth that was there. Um, never knew about it. But there, unfortunately, I had a very leaky wall and it got underneath and it communicated in my home. You know, you're not always going to No, we don't have mold ray vision. 
So even with the best of practices, unless we rip that house down to the studs, we're going to be relying on ancillary data testing, visual evidence history. And in a situation like that, you may not be able to identify that so quickly. So, you know, thank God that in your situation, you were on the latter end of your story, you were able to seal these things up and all of a sudden it improved. Not a surprise. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for speaking to that. Cause I think a lot of people, and what I love you and I've talked about this before um, you're never going to get a perfect space. And so we live, there's mold, there's the outdoor mold, there's indoor mold, and there will be some contaminants in our environment, but it's, where's that threshold? And this may be our next um, area of discussion right. is, so I'm as a clinician, I'm saying, how sensitive is this patient? And do they have mast cell activation and other things that I can help to moderate so that they actually become, my goal is for them to be less sensitive. Like me years ago, I was so sensitive. I could barely travel. Now I travel all over and I get mold exposure and it's not that big a deal. I mean, I just take some charcoal and I'm better in a few hours, but um, it's not as big a deal as it used to be because I'm less sensitive. So the goal is to decrease the sensitivity. But usually when you and I first see the client for you and the patient for me, they're incredibly sensitive. So we do have to figure out the big issues. We take care of them. You come in and find and give them advice, but there may be some um, ways to ongoingly maintain their home and get it to a place where they can live and work and play and breathe and survive in it. No, it's, it's a great topic. It's always a tricky one. I don't think tricky with us just because of how we are, but a lot of people struggle with it. To me, it's like a bell curve, right? And it's just, there's a lot of different analogies, but like return on the investment. And on the back side of the curve is that person that has known issues that you want to take. It's like triage. Uh, they have a moldy crawl space. They had a flood in the house in their basement. I mean, you know, and you almost don't even need sampling or maybe you do and a, a professional is able to find it. I think and I presented on this in 2019 at the ICI conference, it's such a wonderful topic, uh, is what is the goal? I mean, really the goal is patient recovery, um, yeah. but, but there's not a set line. It's not like Jill or I can say 14 spores of this species are good, but 15 and your arm's going to fall off. Yeah. What we're looking for is an honest and trustworthy assessment of what that person feels is normal fungal ecology. I'd like to expand that to normal microbial ecology as we start looking at other things like bacteria. But the point's still the same is what is normal for that home? And normal is your outside influences primarily is what we're talking about. Normal would not be mold growing and releasing uh, structures and other contaminants into your home. That's not normal. Right. So it, that's the goal. Now, whether or not, if I could go one step further, normal is good enough for that person. And assuming that you, the patient, or you, the clinician, feel that you've had trustworthy eyes on that home to give it an honest assessment, you start to, you start to wonder, well, then, number one, could it be something that's not related to the mold, or, or just as an example? And the other thing is, is that maybe they're hypersensitive. I have lots to learn from you, Jill. If their bucket overfloweth and they have no room for, for uh, any exposure, is it possible that the fact that they live in the, uh, surrounded by trees in North Carolina with a river that's 20 feet away, that the outdoor ecology is building up in concentration in their home? And for that individual, this is a question, not a statement, yeah, is yeah. just too much for them. And is there a way that we can turn that sanctuary into more of a sanctuary, knowing that we haven't identified any actual growth in the home? Oh, I love that you said that because we always this narrow the mold, which is definitely a big focus, but it's bigger than that. And I just think of two examples. One is after the World Trade Center and the contaminants that rained down after the fire in that building Uh, and and literally VOCs and everything you could possibly imagine. These people got really, really sick. Their respiratory tract was affected. Some of them, I have a friend in Boulder who was there at the, you know, Downey, the World Trade Center, he still is not the same immune system and, and respiratory system. And clearly mold probably wasn't the main issue is all the other contaminants and, and the very fine particulate that got inhaled. So that was a situation where the environment was so massively toxic that it permanently affected some of these people. The other thing I think about is after like Hurricane Katrina and some of these hurricanes where um, the environment in Louisiana or some of these places become so contaminated. Um, and I see your touch there. Is there anything you want to share? Like just from the tragedy of... <laughs> yeah, we, we see it all. I, yeah. I, I, I'm fortunate to say I don't have direct family. I do have friends who were yeah. affected by 9-11. But what you actually touched on right here was more to do about the general struggle. You get caught up in it. Uh, and we, we're human too. Yes. Um, yeah. And, and, and th- th- this is what you need is you need caring. I mean, we yeah. got to harness it in too when you yeah. need us to perform, of course. But you need somebody who's caring because it does affect you. The good news is, is that you don't have to feel like 
there's no way out. You've, you've been, your, your body is resilient. You may not be operating at tip top shape, but the fact that you're still alive amidst all these other exposures, your body is battling many battles and winning these battles. You just need a little bit of help and guidance and understanding. And so uh, w where it's at for me right now is just understanding a lot of people are stuck. Most people that reach out to me are kind of like the same story you have. You're not the first person. You pray and hope you're the last person. Yeah. Um, and, and when you see the amount of money yeah. they've spent yeah. when you see, uh, and not gone anywhere. I don't, I, I, I don't care if the money was worth it. You're yeah. worth it, but, but they spend their tires or they get bad information or they go on um, social media groups who yeah. mean well, but yeah. give unqualified uh, advice on things. I've seen families yeah. uproot their lives, get yeah. divorces. I had one do it right in front of me Yes. Um, because of a bad ERMI score. Yeah. And yeah. I don't care if it was a fill in the blank, Petri dish, right. mycotoxin right. dust sample. Right. I don't care. It's, it's, you, it's not black and white, folks. We live around this stuff and there is some normalcy to it. I think it's a matter of working with righteous fighters like GL and I tend to be and trying to guide you through, okay, well, here's the low hanging fruit. We agree in, yeah. unanimously that this needs to be taken care of. And as you get on the other side of the curve, it is a process. This journey doesn't take weeks. And I want you to hear this. This journey takes months or years because you've been this way for your, if you're genetically like this or you've been dealing with this for most of your life. I wish there was a light switch. And I'll tell you what, if Jill and I find one, we'll tell you what it is and we'll have it on Amazon. But, but that it might take tr time as you recover. And as you recover, we all have seen this before, your road to recovery isn't this. Your road to recovery is a roller coaster ride. Yes. And you yes. hope that you're trending good. And as you and your clinician are monitoring train using those biomarkers that uh, Jill mentioned earlier or the urine, what, whatever the cluster of symptoms, yeah. whatever that clinician really feels is a good marker for you, then we can adjust as environmental professionals, how much more aggressive do we need to be? Do we want to improve the ventilation in the home? Do we want to add better filtration? You know what? I think it's time to get rid of those carpets now after all, because they're reservoirs. We, we don't just say E all of the above on the, on the back side of the curve, let's deal with the obvious and tweak it as we go because there's no textbook that I can find yeah. that gives you a how to do in every situation and you'll be guaranteed success. I love that. I knew we would get along so well because there's, and, and you know, people be like, well, do I have to get rid of all my books? I have a library in the house. No, store them away if you're concerned. Put them in plastic bins in your garage. You can always go back later. That's what I did. I had my whole medical school library and later I opened them up. They were still really reactive. And I thought, you know what, for me, it wasn't worth it to keep them. But that's not the decision you have to always make in the time being. And there's valuable things. You just store them if you're concerned. And I love the, the stepwise approach because this is, that's part why the denial is there because it affects relationships say if one person doesn't believe you you have to actually go up against that in your relationship in order to get well and so that's a hard thing i i completely understand why there might be denial um mm -hmm. and then there's also the denial of it's going to cost money and time and do i have to move not everybody has to move <laughs> so there's a such a varied and i love your sensible approach because i couldn't agree more you know on speaking of social media recently there was someone who was very angry at me and cited me as someone who says that you don't don't have to avoid mold. I've never said that. I actually think that mold avoidance is a good starting place for the most part, but we live when there's mold indoor, outdoor. And so you have to become more resilient. And the, the reason they said that was because our group ICI has been talking about the fact that there's trauma also associated with mold and in exposure. And that not only do we want to deal with the mold exposure, the physical, the mental, the well-being, but how do you get this limbic loop of fear to stop uh. going and make it worse. And that's a relevant topic. It doesn't mean that we don't want people to avoid mold um, and get well that way. Uh, and the mold avoidance is such a, it's a not a great term because you can't avoid mold completely, right? Right. So yeah. that's just a misnomer. But we really, like, I still believe, yeah, get out of the moldy environment. You won't get well unless you get into a fairly clean environment. So two points. Number one, uh, I, I don't want to forget, so I'm going to say it right now, limbic system. But the first yes. point is also uh, honor health. Uh, that is the goal is that we want to honor the health concerns. And so uh, to your um, credit, when we were doing the conference recently for ICI, we were doing a little bit of Q&A. And it's always tough when somebody throws you the, con uh, the question of how do you deal with contents? And you were my wing woman and you kind of helped me on a couple of things, one of which was mattresses. And I thought you knocked it out of the park. When you look at the intimacy of the item and how much you might yeah. be exposed to them in the certain situations, 
it, 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 first of all, there's going to be a general agreement that you don't want to have a moldy bed, but we, we don't just trip over ourselves without consideration of its history. So people need to hear that for those of you that say, well, they just say get rid of everything. Well, no, we don't say get rid of everything. Let's talk about it first and yeah. see what that item is, uh, how easy or challenging is it to clean, and, and, and how you might be able to either get rid of it or get it out of your environment. The analogy you used was store it in a secure location, get it out. Because I use this analogy all the time and for some people it clicks really well. Your life, you're the patient who's struggling, is not X plus Y equals Z. Right. Your life is X plus 99 other variables equals you. And we are trying to remove the variables, the unknown ones, without you getting, having to um, get a second mortgage or get a divorce so that we can get you out of the fog that you're in and start your life. It might cost you a lot to throw away that thousand dollar mattress, but I don't got my handy dandy calculator here, but I'm guessing you spend a lot more in treatment and other ancillary costs that we haven't even touched on. Yeah. So yeah. for the first part, just on contents real quick, and I'd love to get your thoughts on this is the limbic system issue, the PTSD, because I'll tell you, if people asked me, Mike, in 2019, what was the biggest thing that you saw that was the most improvement? Like, was it a special test? Yeah. Was it a special remediation technique? Or what was it, Mike? None of the above for me. What the biggest thing was, was dealing with the limbic system. Um, it doesn't get rid of your core diagnosis. You're still going to have CIRS if you have CIRS. But I saw people who I had worked with over months and years, um, where all of a sudden they took a couple of the well-known programs that are out there and they were a different person. And it was like their utility came back. The smiles came back. They were just a different person. Where do you see that fall into your, your experience? Oh, love that. Because again, um, my experience, one thing too, is I don't ever, if I talk about my experience, it doesn't mean I think that all my patients are like me. I never, I treat people so individually, but all I have in, inside me is what I experienced to go on as far as to tell you, this is what I felt and how I, and I say that because this was actually an, a massive aha for me personally to realize there's this tagging of trauma and mold and um, mold itself stimulates through trichosethenes. This is science-based guys. Like this is not esoteric, you know, woo-woo. There is science that shows that these, some of these uh, toxins that are produced by mold called mycotoxins will actually stimulate areas of the brain like the amygdala, like the hippocampus. And we can actually see on MRI imaging and other ways where there's atrophy or hypertrophy of the different areas, usually more hypertrophy of amygdala, which is your fight or flight or you know scared type of response, and more hypertrophy of something like the hippocampus, which is memory and word finding. These are objective findings. And what, what I realize is in treating, we can take away the, get the environment clean, we can detox the patient, do all the things we need to do, but there's still a lot of fear around re-exposure and around their health. And I experienced it way back five years ago. I remember that like being terrified of getting sick again or getting re-exposed because just to uh, validate you, if you're listening out there and have had mold, it is so hard. You get so sick and you can't think straight and you are spending money that you don't have. And there's so many things that are very difficult about this and you don't, and it's so mysterious. And because you look okay on the outside, a lot of times people don't believe you. So then there's this, this just crazy bits of, of this combination that make it a really difficult illness. So I have great compassion if you're struggling with that. And I promise you, look at me, right? <laughs> I am not telling you it's all in your head. It's not in your head. But your brain has been, received a signal of danger. And that danger signal will keep stimulating your body and creating the cell danger response, which causes all kinds of havoc in your cells. And if you don't stop that signal and try to help to rehab that signal to say, hey, it's safe, it's okay. Through some program, there's hundreds of things you can do. And some of the ones you mentioned, DNRS is out there, Gupta's program, and there's many, many other somatic-based therapies, cranial sacral therapies, um, even biurinal beats, which is a type of music that can calm the brain. So there's lots of things you can do. But any way that you address this overactivation of that fear response will help you get well. And that's just, it's proven. I've seen it over and over. And it is not saying, this is a chemical response that causes a fear response. So it's a real response. It's not in your head. But if yeah. you address that, you're going to get to the next level. 
Yeah, it's yeah, it's not the crazy comment. It's not the psychosomatic no, comment. It, it's all. it's the opposite of that. It's actually mm -hmm. saying because if you think about it from a different perspective, it's kind of because you've gone through the legitimate yeah. stuff you've gone for. You've created this new environment. It's just your survival. This is how you've adapted. Yeah. Perhaps not the best way. Um, anyways, it's it's yet another example of the challenges we deal with in trying to help prioritize uh, yeah. both environmentally and clinically what makes the most sense on that bell curve uh, yeah. for that patient to get better. Because at every step of the way, we know that you're spending money, time, and resources, and big word here, trust. Yeah. And it gets overwhelming. You need to align yourself with people who, if they can't help you, they can at least direct you to other professionals that they know can get the job done. And that's what I found myself doing for the last couple, two, three years exclusively. Yeah, so you do. So tell us just a little bit about you actually get on the phone and do you, are you on like Zoom where you could have them take, walk you around the house or how does that work with your consultations? Yeah, so probably the last two or three years I've been doing a lot of Zoom virtual. Actually, it's the same yeah. platform. I use yeah. the same microphone. Some people recognize it right now. Yeah. Um, and, and, but it starts a lot the same way. It's a questionnaire, client intake, give me the history, give me the diagnosis, give me the areas of concern. A lot of times what myself or my, my office manager will have them do is, you know, give us photos or short videos of the areas yeah. of concern. Yes, you're right. There are certain times where if they have Zoom on their phone or their laptop, they can yeah. come over and bring it. But to a little side tech issue, a lot of times we find that that's distracting and blurry and the lighting's not yeah. right. So right. to me, Okay. The main, uh, the biggest takeaway of the virtual consultations that we've got in terms of positive feedback is the quarterbacking, the education, the guidance um, when they don't know where to start. And yeah. in many times, it's clients who reach out to us and say, the classic, we've had two professionals give us different opinions and one is recommending $50,000 worth of work. The other one says there's not a problem. We'd really like you to give your opinion and knowing and I am by no means, I, I admitted the first one to raise my hand of not being perfect. Um, I, I'm, that's what I'm surgical at doing is being able to at least acknowledge the information we do know about chronic illness, but at the same exact moment, being able to say, well, we don't know this and here's why. However, let's honor the health and what the ultimate goal is and let's find a way uh, that fits your finances, your logistics and your, I mean, I can't tell you the number of times where people will send us in their questionnaire and at the bottom they'll say, please don't say anything, but my husband doesn't believe anything in this. And I will tell them if it's at all possible, please have that husband show up. And it's classically an engineer background. And, and I can, I can, I, because they don't have nothing, they don't have nothing to defend. I, I, I want to listen to their concerns and I want to give them that science. They want to know more about the, the methodology of the testing. They want to know about what is CIRS? Is that some bar yeah. napkin idea that you or Jill came up with? We <laughs> give them the science and that way they understand that this isn't some guy selling snake oil. We acknowledge what we know, what we don't know. Folks, if you're that husband that's listening that doesn't believe anything, this is not a, this is not a test code that you get prescribed uh, with conventional medicine. You are off the grid dealing with chronic illness, functional diagnostic medicine, things that are new, that are paving the way, that are identifying the thing that 50 years ago, your old man told you just to shut it up and take an Advil and quit your complaining. We're, we're learning more and more and you have incredible people like Jill who's been there Mm -hmm. uh, who can help you get out of the weeds when it's not black and white, because sometimes we deal with people who think that in order to have a problem of mold exposure, it needs to be that 20 square feet of mold going up the wall I mentioned earlier. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. And like you said, it's so not often, I mean, not always the case. Sometimes it is. Let's yeah, go yeah. to after. So say they found the 20 feet up the wall, they took out the wall, they did everything right. Sure. To me, the, 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 the reason why some people can't stay in that remediated home is what the aftercare. It's like after surgery, what do you need to do? And yeah. I want to talk a little bit about that because I think that for me has been a big eye opener in getting them to a safe place in that remediated home. You know, so what would you recommend like small particulate clean HVAC system? What would be your order of operations after remediation to make sure that that home can be the cleanest it could be for that patient? Sure. So to me, if I'm hearing you right, the term is how can we create and or maintain sanctuary at that point? Perfect. All right. So that's helpful. So, um, it, it, there's four, if I do my math right, fundamental things that we will talk about with people to do. And, and one of them depends on where they live for sure. Uh, and that is um, certainly housekeeping, removing reservoirs. So this is an issue of cleaning, dust cleaning, vacuuming, damp wiping, dry wiping, getting rid of reservoirs if possible, like carpets and rugs. Rugs are easier to deal with. I Listen, I don't sure. like to walk on hard floors that much either, so I get it. 
and then the next level, of course, it, we, we talk about is um, uh, filtration. And so there's all sorts of options there. There's portable Quick question filtration. question on the first one. I'm sorry. Yeah. To interrupt, um, what about plants or water features? What would you say about are those? It goes back to that equation issue where, you know, you'll have somebody that raises their hand and say, well, we saw this thing from NASA that said that it's good at removing certain VOCs. And I go, that might be the case, but your clinician is telling you that you're having upregulation of your genes from mold. And yeah. I see a planted tree in your living room. Yeah. So let's minimize the variables and let's get okay. it out of that environment for now. If you want to be a green thumb after the fact, let me honor that. I'll buy you, a, you know, I, I, try to, I try to humor them and say, I'll help you with that. But I would stay, and water features is the same thing. They're, 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 they're prevalent, especially larger features for biofilm production. And let's be clear, we're not saying just because you have biofilm production that you're automatically going to have an exposure, but it's kind of an elephant in the room concern yes. uh, to answer that question. Okay. Um, when you get to filtration, it can either be portable systems or whole house systems, whole house mm -hmm. or just kind of what you might have under your air handler. Some people have a standard one inch filter or they'll upgrade it to a more robust, higher MERV rated filter. And yeah. we can get into some of those details after I give you the overview. Uh, portable systems, we're familiar with a sleuth of them. I'm a big fan of air filtration. Mm -hmm. I'm more hesitant to initially recommend purification only because of what we don't know. And, and, and I've interviewed a, a company on IEP radio. I think they have wonderful products. It doesn't change the variable equation that we talked about. And then we get into mechanical ventilation. Mechanical ventilation is bringing in uh, air mechanically properly when you feel like that house that you just got done sealing up is built too tight and you need to, to help remove contaminants that won't otherwise be removed with the, the former two methods. Those are, uh, or three methods, uh, two methods. Those, those methods are the big boys. The one thing of course is moisture control. Yeah. So if you're in a humid climate, let's pick on Florida. Um, you're going to likely have to have some sort of additional mechanical ventilation, I'm sorry, dehumidification system to regulate those moisture levels because uh, ex with the exception of a, of a few cases, your air conditioning system is not going to be able to get you in that target relative humidity of somewhere between say 40 and 50%. And so that might mean getting supplemental dehumidifiers. Some people roll their eyes and go, I don't got time to deal with that. I don't want to have to work with that. So they'll look at getting whole house dehumidifiers that they can integrate into their system. When you do those four things, and again, your example was you've already dealt with known sources mm -hmm. yeah. on the inside of the home. I think that's a, a, a great, it's a big, but a great starting point to maintain that sanctuary where the minutia starts to come pouring out is every home is different and you might have other underlying issues that need to be addressed first. What if they cleaned up the remediation in the, or the mold in the crawl space, but they didn't uh, address the moisture that was getting in there in the, in, in the first place to make that happen? Yes. Sounds to me like yeah. they may need to have some drainage improvements and I would be helping them get on that before mm -hmm. I have them upgrade their mechanical ventilation system in a mold complaint. Yeah. So it depends. Well, that's so helpful, Michael. That's what I want to do is kind of do it's, and, and I think you kind of mentioned it in the very beginning there um, because that was so thorough. But one of the things I find um, is that after the remediation, getting a really, really deep, we call it small particulate clean. It can oh, be, I see. right? And it doesn't have to be like, there are companies that come and charge a lot of money for that. You, I believe you can do this yourself or get your person as long as you give them good instructions. This is not a difficult thing. It's no. just a detail thing. Is that right? Would you comment on it that? It is. When you said remediation in my mind, I was thinking yeah. the cleaning, everything. That should done. go I with it, right? Out. But I think some people don't. So you're right. A good remediator will actually include the clean, right? But they, not they, a newer, right. A newer aged, um, chronic illness aware, mm -hmm. um, new paradigm way of thinking would probably talk to you about whole house cleaning. Yeah. Unfortunately, we, we'll save it for another interview. There's there's politics involved and other things that might, they would be specific to the areas they're working on. But here's the takeaway. Yeah. The small particle cleaning that you're talking about, you're right. You don't have to have a professional deal do it beyond any additional costs. It's going to be a matter of like logistics. Can you physically do it? I don't really want somebody who's got CIRS as just an example right. <laughs> uh, to be doing the work. Yeah, um, yeah exactly. You know, but but you, there, are, um, there are a couple different DIY um, small particle cleaning that involves uh, a process of misting to drop particles out of the mm -hmm. air, followed by rounds of clean that a person yeah. could probably get done in their house for less than $1,500 comparatively mm -hmm. to a professional 
who might bring with them that experience, that efficiency. Yeah. You don't got to, because some of this requires that you move contents out of the home. Yes. I'm looking at your screen yeah. right now. Those books would have to All get moved books. out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but, but when money is an issue, yeah. what I would recommend clients do is they look at these options, but do yourself a favor. If you're going to spend the money, reach out to an IEP like myself. It doesn't have to be me. There's plenty of people on ICI's website. We can talk about that in a second that you can reach out to. Let them be your quarterback and make sure that whatever process you're doing, not only is seemingly appropriate, but the timing of it is appropriate. You get done telling me that you're going to do a remodel in the kitchen a week later. Why don't we wait until the, the, the remodel is done? Uh, you know, so there's, Amen. there's that yes. Yeah, order is like that has to come kind of last after you, not yeah. last, last, but like, you don't want to do a big clean. Uh, oh, and you don't want to tell me, maybe I'm wrong on this, but HVAC system, shouldn't that be cleaned either simultaneously before you do the small particulate? Because that's just going to disperse. Yeah. Wrong it, it, <laughs> no, you're right. Okay. It's just because HVAC systems get their own topic to discuss about. Yeah. And it's one of those things where there's the challenges of, of, of duct cleaning. But yes, if you're going to do duct cleaning, let's just assume that was the decision to be made. Uh -huh. Uh, I would normally have them do that before they do yeah. the final clean because you know there's going to be little onesie yeah. twosies that are going to escape out of that. Okay, I want to make because that's what I tell patients. I want to make sure we are aligned with that with order. Oh, yeah. And it is all perfect world. It doesn't always go like that, but right. Um, well, good. Well, as we wrap up, what's from? And first of all, I just want to acknowledge. Um, I love your heart, Mike. I love what you bring to this. I love um, the the passion and the purpose because you are so above and beyond just the technical details. You really bring, like you've clearly shown us here, even in the interview, but I just want to acknowledge who you are as a human being and your character and what you bring to this. And that is so rare and we appreciate you so much. So thank yeah, you. That, that same compliment is extended your way. I've seen tears and I've seen, and that's what, <laughs> what's missing. You don't, our, our job isn't to fall apart on the job site, no. but our job is to care. Yes. If you can't, if you can't empathize, at least sympathize and, and be able to, um, uh, realize the struggles these people are going to because it's it's a cadence that you have to figure out with these patients you just can't come all in there all militaristic with all a wealth of information right. <laughs> and think that everyone's going to jump in line behind you so yeah. thank you uh, for your kindness. You are welcome so let's uh, share our you know mutual organization ICI um, we're both on the board so that's our only connection as far as just it's a great great nonprofit group with physicians and IEPs and information it's really geared towards teaching the clinic so if you're a clinician, you should join. Um, but if you're a, a patient or client, you might find resources there or people to, um, to call. And then um, we've given, go ahead and give your website again, Mike, where people can find you and uh, anything else you want to say about that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, a couple quick things. Uh, if you're wanting to reach out to me professionally, environmental analytics, uh, .net, environmental analytics, one big long word, .net, not .com. Um, and you can reach out. You can look at all the information, my background. Uh, there's a contact page. That's how we filter in 99% of our clients because we want to honor your concerns and, and not get you lost in, in the phone calls and all that. Um, for free resources, um, uh, hot topics, we've talked about air conditioning. We talk about remediation. Those things are covered. Um, great interviews, uh, ieprradio.com, ieprradio.com. Take a look up there. It doesn't just have video casts where you can see us talking and bringing up references and all this good stuff. There's also audio cast so you can, or podcast so you can listen in your car. And also there's references. A lot of times it's like, well, what study? You keep claiming a study. Well, I've listed it there for you. So there's a, a dedicated page for you to, to reference it in case you are a data-driven person and you want that science. Mm -hmm. And then finally, I'll plug ICI. For those of you who are looking for resources, um, actually, let me do this real, real quick um, uh, with you. Uh, right here is a find get help page. Uh, this is from their website, ICI.org. You say click help, you go here. You can find people uh, that are members, clinicians and IEPs who might be in your area and help you. Um, for the clinicians who are wanting to build a network of professionals and IEP, if you already have one, God bless you. If you don't and you're looking for guidance, consider uh, reaching down to a couple professionals that are on here. Some of these professionals provide virtual services and they can guide you and help you build that network. There's a great uh, free resource of um, you know, how, to, how to pick an IEP, a free document available, high level stuff for free to explain a little bit more about IEPs. I, I see, ICI is doing the best they can to teach people as, as rapidly as we can, but to honor the science and not get ahead of ourselves. And that's what I love about this organization. 
Me too. And Michael, we are so fortunate to have you as part of it. You've just been spearheading these efforts and I'm beyond grateful. So I want to publicly acknowledge all of your work. Um, thank you so much for your time today. Um, better than I hoped. We'll have to do this again. Yeah. Um, so I hope you all enjoyed this. You can re-listen here. You can check out IEP Radio for more. And then you can also go to my YouTube channel for more videos. I will be sure and include the links we mentioned on the Facebook Live as well. So if uh, I'll hop in there in a few minutes and make sure those are all included. And thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Jill. Appreciate it.